What's up, Internet? Welcome to Once Over. I'm Kaylee, and today we're going to be giving the Once Over to five movies from the year 2020, which you probably haven't seen. All right, so we all know that 2020 was an extremely challenging year for movies and you know, pretty much everything. And that kind of resulted in a lot of movies from the year 2020 getting sort of misplaced or not seen by many because they didn't have theatrical releases. A lot of the films that were getting made in 2019 and supposed to be released in 2020 ended up switching over to streaming. We all also had a ton of spare, spare time, I don't know, home time that we didn't previously have in, you know, 2019. So because of that, people were watching a ton of stuff, but most of that was stuff like Tiger King and more lighthearted shit. So today we're talking about five of my favorites from 2020 that I think you probably have not seen. Don't forget to let me know how wrong I am and which ones you've seen. First we're going to be talking about M.O.M. Mother of Monsters. This movie was directed by Tuccia Lyman, and if you were just to look at the poster of it, you would probably be like, wow, that looks like the dumbest movie that has ever existed. It looks like drivel. It looks super unexciting. I put it on on a whim and ended up being extremely pleasantly surprised. It is about a mother who becomes afraid of her son being a clinical psychopath, so she starts putting cameras around so that she can spy on him, or document him, I guess is what she wants to act like it is. And this film is equally introspective about the mom's character as it is the son's. It is in the found footage style because most of it takes place with either the son talking to the camera or the mom putting up these cameras around to document him. But it's very different than other found footage films in the sense that you don't get that like really challenging shaky cam stuff, which makes it a little bit more technically sound than I find a lot of those films. The storyline operates with multiple red herrings, which makes you not really sure if you're getting red herring within a red herring, which is super cool. It's like a double fake out, triple fake out, what's happening. You pretty much never know. But really, the most incredible part of this film is the acting. Melinda Page Hamilton plays the mom and Bailey Edwards plays the son. And the two of them together are powerful. Their relationship is intimate loving, hating. It is all of the things that you could possibly want. And honestly, a film like this does not work if they don't work together. Ed Asner is also in it. That's fun. The film is overall very intimate and it kind of gives you a we need to talk about Kevin sort of vibe if you've seen that one. This one's a little bit more playful than that one. I don't know. And of course, the moral of the movie is PlayStation is bad. Next up, we have The Hunt, which was directed by Craig Zobel who also directed Compliance, which is fucking outstanding. All right, a lot of people don't like The Hunt. A lot of people don't like The Hunt that haven't even seen The Hunt. Um, I'm going to explain to you why it rules. So first of all, this film is a satire. It is intended to be tongue and cheek, and it is. So it talks a lot about the political divide in America, but it makes fun of both sides, the left and the right equally, at least in my opinion. I think that it was a big challenge for people because it had its theatrical release on March 13th, which was, you know, three days before everything shut down entirely. It did end up going to a streaming release, but I think that maybe people were just feeling a little bit too raw about the sensitive topic of politics to have this movie come out at that exact time. It's about a group of rich elites who kidnap and hunt um, people of the working class, the deplorables which is an obvious take on the most dangerous game. The action is outstanding, the pacing amazing. It has dark humor, it's visually pleasing, it's brutal. So if the biggest problem that people had was that the audiences were experiencing discomfort about politics, I think that's a really, really dumb reason to not check this movie out. Again, maybe the reason that this movie got a little, you know, swept under the rug is because it asks the question, do you have any hand sanitizer? Next up, we have Pieces of a Woman, which is directed by somebody whose name I do not know how to pronounce. I am sorry. I am not going to try. Pieces of a Woman is a deeply personal story about a home birth gone awry. The heart-wrenching subject matter is offset by the peaceful imagery that happens throughout the film. And quite honestly, the cinematography is one of the things that makes this film stand out so much. There are two extremely long continuous shots where I, I, you, I mean, you can't breathe when you're watching it. 
Vanessa Kirby and Shia LaBeouf are intimate and stunning and beautiful and just... I never thought I would say that about Shia LaBeouf. Jesus Christ, what the fuck am I saying? Oh, also Kirby burping a whole bunch, like an absurd amount, is magical. Girl, I have a daughter. Oh. Are you taking the trash out? Because I can smell something really strange. I'll take it out. If you were a fan of A Marriage Story, I think that this is a good almost sequel to that. It's obviously not. It's obviously not. But, you know, first comes marriage, then comes the baby in the baby carriage. <sighs> Kill me. Something that I also really loved about this film is that there is a lot of emotional growth that happens throughout it. We have a lot of scenes which are almost entirely dialogue free, which brings a deeply personal realness to the storyline. And this movie wouldn't have worked if that wasn't the case. Yeah, I'm emotionally drained after this one, so uh, let's talk about something funny, right? Yeah, we're gonna talk about Shiva, baby. It's funnier than Pieces of a Woman. Two non-horror movies, how exciting. Shiva Baby was directed by Emma Seligman and it tells the story of a Jewish bisexual sugar baby who is going to a Shiva with her parents. Unsurprisingly, it is full of Jewish humor. I guess I probably should have said a Shiva is a Jewish mourning tradition. Shiva means seven, you mourn for seven days after somebody passes. I grew up Jewish and so I really like a lot of these films that are Judaism centric, but I don't know if the jokes actually land for people who didn't grow up with this heritage. For example, I think that When Do We Eat is maybe one of the funniest movies that I've ever seen in my life because any Jewish kid or anybody who has gone to a Passover Seder knows that that is the question that you're asking the whole time because you're hungry and you smell food and when the fuck do we eat? Oh, Mama, I can't eat that. Why not? I'm vegetarian. You're killing me. I've told you it so many times. You have not eaten a single thing all day. That's because we just got here. You look like Gwyneth Paltrow on food stamps. Oh. But I don't think that other people like that movie that much. That's another one. I should do that. What year did that come out? We'll work on that at some point. Every moment in this film deeply resonates with me. For example, when her mom is kind of coaching her on how to explain her disorganized life because obviously she's a sex worker, she's not going to school, she's not doing all the things that your Jewish mother wants you to be doing. So her mom is like coaching her about how to talk to people and make herself sound more impressive. No funny business with Maya. Thank you. You think everyone that's bi is experimenting? You have zero gaydar. Excuse me, kid. I lived through New York in the 80s. My gaydar is strong as a bull. And she's constantly getting asked about things like, oh, well, do you have a boyfriend? And being told that she's fat by everybody. Every Jewish mother does this, I swear to God. There's also a bunch of things that, again, I don't really know if you would get if you weren't Jewish. For example, at one point in the film, they use a hand washing bowl, which is a part of, again, Jewish tradition where you are cleansing your hands um, in order to clean coffee off a shirt, which is just like one of those moments where you're like, yeah, you probably shouldn't do that. The film is witty, playful, and claustrophobic, and I love that sort of discomfort. Plus, it's just super relatable for me to have somebody just emotionally destroying you at all times. Also, I love complaining. That's my other Jew thing. That doesn't happen a ton in this movie. Just throwing that out there. I'm a stereotype. Yay! Another thing that I think is really cool about this one is that it has almost a horror-esque soundtrack to it, uh, which builds this crazy tension for this, like, I don't want to call it lighthearted, but for this comedy, black comedy sort of movie. You know what? He has a cousin that works in publishing. No. Maybe he can help you. Mom, oh, no. stop. I don't, I have to go no, to the bathroom. No, no, no. Let's go. Mom. Do do? I don't want to. Come I'll go me. later. Now. I didn't no, no. I didn't eat yet. Come on. And come I'll, on. I'll just get I'll get us number later. Now. Stop. Now. Now. No. 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 Mom. No. Mom. It's a really cool effect. It's a little bit aimless, but I do feel like the moral of the movie is that there is an awful lot of pressure for perfection out there. And also, if your sugar daddy marries a shiksa, you're probably fucked. And lastly, we have Host, directed by Rob Savage. This is really the movie that made me want to do 2020. I love this film. It's about a bunch of friends who go on Zoom and perform a seance and some weird shit starts happening to all of them in their individual locations. Of course, this means that it is told through the perspective of a computer screen, and I know a lot of people don't like that, but let me tell you, Host does it 
right. Actually, I really like Open Windows and Unfriended also. I might just like these sorts of movies. Host is really great though. This one's the one. This movie was filmed entirely during the COVID pandemic and moreover, it was filmed at the height of the strictest guidelines for quarantine. This meant that the actors themselves were in charge of their makeup, their hair, their special effects, absolutely everything. They were doing it all. This was the thing, right? When we started the film, literally Rob was just like, go around your houses and find interesting things. Like find things that are gonna, just weird stuff. And they had this bag of ropes. And um, so before we actually had like the scriptment or anything, he was just like, play around with stuff in your house. So they would get on Zoom calls before they would start filming and like talk with a special effects makeup artist who was like, okay, yeah, put the bruising over here, do this sort of thing, whatever. I think that's fucking rad. So impressive, extremely, extremely impressive. Especially because there are some pretty insane scenes, including a fire scene and also a crazy weird wire rigging scene with a swimming pool. Um, I can't even imagine doing my own stunt work and stuff like that. It's crazy. Bonkers. These people are nuts. Host only has a 57 minute runtime, so it's not entirely a feature length film, but I really appreciate that they didn't try to push it any further because I think that any longer I would have been like, all right, I'm done with the Zoom conversations, I get it. It doesn't have any scares that we haven't seen before. I mean, you know, it's all kind of the same sort of scares with stuff like this, but there is something about how genuinely Host does it and how intimate you feel because you are on this Zoom screen with these people that makes this one better than the others. As it turns out, cliches work as long as they are done with skill. The movie feels extremely authentic because I believe that there was a lot of ad-libbing done by the characters, which makes sense um, to kind of do this more with a film treatment than it would to do it with an actual script. That's really important in a movie like this because you need to be able to have the interactions between the characters feel authentic. And again, this movie does that in spades. Having all of the actors quarantined while filming this, but still showing how interconnected they are with each other is a massive feat. I can't say enough good things about this movie. I recommend host to pretty much everybody. And again, it's not a big time commitment. Just go watch it. There's also a short that the director did, which is how this movie ended up getting made. So he like filmed a short and then Shudder saw it, I think. And they were like, hey, can you make this into an entire movie? And he was like, yes. So. Thank God for that. All right, so that concludes the list of five movies from the year 2020, which I think are absolutely outstanding, but you probably haven't seen. What do you think is a movie from 2020 that I haven't seen? Give me some stuff to watch. I always need new stuff to watch. I'll be picking more years and doing more stuff pretty soon, so don't forget to subscribe, turn on the notifications, like, comment, all of the things. That means a lot to me. I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for watching, and I can't wait for the next one. 